day or the week. Yeah, they give you a certain time where they're available, let's say like 4 to 6 p.m. every Wednesday. And during that time, it's either you go to them in their office physically or you drop in a Zoom call and then you can just ask any questions about like the you know, subject of teaching. So like the teachers are generally like very accommodating, like that, that time is really allotted for you to go drop in and ask questions. And in terms of the guidance counselors, you don't really have like, it's not like high school where you have this one person that, you know, you can always go to. Um, there's so many departments that you can find in, in college abroad, like, and it really depends on what your need is. So let's say if you have questions about um, getting an internship or like careers, and there's like a career services department, or if you have questions about like, um, let's say, uh, like, of safety, campus safety, there's a division. In my school, we call it Division of Public Safety, um, DPS. So uh, usually during the orientation, they give you a list of numbers and emails that you know you can contact if you have any needs. So it's like, it's very, actually, it's very meticulous. Um, they have a particular department for pretty much any of your need, needs apart from you know, academics, which are handled by your professors. So yeah, that's the first myth that I hear all the time. And then the second myth in, is probably that there are no scholarships for international students. And most of the scholarships that exist are either need-based or merit, um, yeah, need-based only for like, you know, if you're applying to the US, it's only for Americans. And that's also not true. It's true that some colleges um, aren't need-blind and they're need-aware, which means that they'll take, um, they'll look at the fact that you require financial aid when um, kind of judging or no, assessing your application rather. But there are definitely scholarships, um, both internal and external scholarships. So by internal scholarships, those are usually the ones that you're, the school you're applying to will offer. So it's like most commonly known as financial aid. But in terms of external scholarships, those are like um, programs that external foundations kind of have where they fund, you know, students, um, qualified students, and, you know, they give them sometimes allowances or stipends abroad. So my biggest tip for, I mean, in, internal scholarships is pretty straightforward. You just apply, um, usually you just take a box in the Common App, and then you have to submit some documents. But with external scholarships, sometimes it's a bit, you know, harder to find. Uh, but one tip is that you look for foundations. Like, there are a lot of popular ones. I know Coca-Cola does um, external scholarships. Um, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation does scholarships. But when you look for these scholarships, um, you search for a foundation and you have to make sure that they sponsor international students or like Philippine. Um, it's good to look for foundations within the Philippines. That, that's the most um, you know, straightforward. But if you want to look outside at like a multinational like Coca-Cola, then you have to make sure that you know that program you're looking at um, is specific to, let's say, Southeast Asia, or, you know, the, basically you have to make sure that the Philippines is covered. Um, and then moving on, number three is that only grades and test scores are important. Uh, so in the past, maybe, you know, 20, 30 years ago, this might have been true, but it isn't true anymore, unfortunately. Um, for the U.S., like some people I know would get uh, very high SAT score, like 1600, but that doesn't, like, they wouldn't even get into dream school. Um, yeah, because a high SAT score won't guarantee you entry. The U.S., um, in the U.S., colleges always, like, admissions officers always say that they have this holistic assessment of, like, your profile, which means that they don't just look at your grades, but they look at, like, you know, your extracurriculars, um, you as a person, like, what are your goals, um, academic goals or what are your career goals so um, and they also look at your recommendation letters which are um, a big thing also so like you have to consider all these things just because you have perfect grades doesn't mean that um, you're guaranteed success and for the UK even if I don't study there um, I know that there's a minimum cutoff for grades um, in a lot of colleges and their um, offers are usually like conditional, which means that if you don't meet the minimum cutoff by the time you graduate, then they're gonna rescind or take like reject your offer. Um, but you still have recommendation letters for the UK and that's very important because it tells the school and it tells the admissions officer like what kind of learner you are and kind of 
again, like what your academic interests are and basically like uh, your goals and you know how you behave in the classroom, all that. Okay, um, number four, um, speaking of needing extracurricular activities, uh, a lot of people kind of overstate this. It's a bit exaggerated. People think you need the impressive extracurriculars to study abroad or to get in like, oh, I need to make like something, you know, like that a big company would recognize and like, I don't know, I need, a, I need to like really impress a lot of people. Which is, this isn't true. Um, there's a difference between uh, well-rounded and spike students, right? So spike students are those people who have one thing, they're really good at one thing, and they have a lot, a lot of achievements. Like let's say you're a math um, mathlete uh, and you compete in a lot of math competitions and you win a lot. Um, those are the spike students. But personally, I wasn't a spike student. I was more of the well-rounded person that I did debate. I also did some charity work. Um, you know, um, that type of person. I also played a few sports. So it definitely works both ways. You don't have to be really, really good at a specific thing. But at the same time, if you are, then that's already a good thing. Um, you don't have to pressure yourself to do everything at, at the same time. So it's just about finding that balance. You know, what are you actually interested in? What are you good at? But not overdoing it. Um, and they also con consider context, right? Like um, some people, they have a lot of finances or they, they have a lot of connections. So, you know, they can get to do really grand things with the extracurriculars. But of course, some people um, who are not so fortunate, most people who are not as fortunate um, would not be able to do that. So obviously um, the, the college, you know, they're humans too. They understand your situation. They know that you're trying to basically make the best out of your own situation. So don't worry about that too much. And then number five is something that would seem a bit um, unreasonable, but I actually hear it a lot. It's that it's impossible to get into schools abroad as a Filipino. Uh, maybe because like they think, you know, um, the Philippines is a small country or whatever, which is not true. The Philippines is not a small country. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, if you look at camp every year, we have different speakers um, from a, you know, a range of backgrounds and we all succeeded in studying abroad. I think the biggest thing about studying abroad is that you have to really be committed. Um, if you, you know, you have to go through the process. There are a lot, like for the US, there are a lot of essays you need to write. Um, you need to get recommendations. And, you know, there's also the bit about extracurriculars. So like, it's early to, uh, it, I mean, it's best to start early and start thinking about it early. But in terms of actually being able to do it, um, you know, with the variety of scholarships available and financial aid, uh, as long as you set your mind to it, I think it's achievable. And number six is related to number five. Um, a lot of people say only international school kids get into good colleges, you know, or only the people who took the IB or AP classes can study abroad. Um, that's not true, actually, because as you can tell, um, camp gets a lot of um, students who go to local schools. Um, to talk for them. And yeah, IB and AP, they're just um, programs that are quote unquote internationally recognized, but actually the um, US schools, they, they recognize it a bit more obviously because a lot of people take it, but it doesn't actually stop you from uh, getting in. They also, you know, they also kind of acknowledge that um, every country, every school has its own system, and they also do take the time to try to understand, you know, the curriculum that your school offers. And they won't, like, they won't judge you because you're really just limited to what your school offers, right? So when you're an outstanding student in your school, they'll take that into consideration. Um, and it's not like you can't, it's not like you can go beyond what your school offers, right? So if your school doesn't offer like 25 different classes or 25 different subjects and, you know, you don't worry about it. Um, just again, I think this has been like a recurring theme throughout my talk. Just make the most out of your situation. Um, yeah, and about the international school thing. Um, yeah, I, they, these people tend to publicize that, oh, you know, we got a kid into Harvard or something. Um, but actually there have been other students who got into really good schools um, who come from local schools, you know. Uh, it's just that there's just, it's, these schools are just feeder schools, which means that there's a trend where every year 
um, they tend to get people into good schools. But that doesn't mean that, you know, it's only um, schools abroad are only focused on international schools and they ignore the other schools, um, other local schools. So, yeah. And then now I'm going to move on to life abroad because the past seven, six myths rather, have been about like applying to college and the whole process. So about life abroad, um, especially in the US, people always tell me, uh, they always ask me, oh, isn't it too expensive to live abroad? Isn't it not worth the money? Because, you know, the living standards are higher. The exchange rate is really whack right now. Um, and it's true, it's generally more expensive to live abroad because, uh, you know, living standards are higher. But honestly, um, there are ways to work around it. Uh, if you get a stipend from financial aid, then like, you know, a stipend is an allowance. So you, you do have some breathing room there, but even if you don't, um, most colleges in the U S have a meal plan. So you actually, most of my spending, like my out of pocket expenses come from food or just, um, you know, dining with friends outside of campus. But if you really want to save money, you don't actually have to do that because, um, the cafeteria is open like 24 seven, not 24 seven, but seven days a week at least. So, you know, there are a lot of ways to basically, um, save money but more of, uh, about the point that studying abroad is not worth the money i think that i mean i'm biased of course because i study abroad but you know the international experience that i get you know meeting i mean first living abroad and living in an entirely new country with a different culture you know people talk differently um, people act differently that's like something that you won't really get here because you know philippines is home and you know, um, you basically grew up here all your life. Nothing, um, you won't really experience anything extremely new going to college. But what I really enjoyed about college is the international experience that I mentioned earlier. Like you get to meet people from all over, all over the world, not just Americans, um, you know. And you really get to just learn more about their experiences, you know, how they applied to college, what they plan to do after college. And, you know, you get to make these friends and it just makes you a more like, not only culturally aware, but um, like just for, makes you appreciate your own, uh, your own culture as well. Um, yeah. And number eight is that making friends while studying abroad will be too hard um, and you'll lose all your friends from the Philippines because you're, you know, you're spending time away. Actually, for me, that's not true because I came back the, to the Philippines this summer and, you know, I'm actually still pretty close to a lot of my friends. Um, I, we get dinners outside, you know, we still hang out. Um, and it doesn't mean that you'll lose your friends when you leave, right? You can still message them. You can still have calls with them from time to time. Um, I don't think that's really a big concern. It's more about whether you are willing to make the effort to keep in contact with them. And then um, about my first point that making friends while studying abroad is too hard. That's not true also because when you come into college as a freshman, you know, everyone is new to the whole environment. Like no one comes into college with a friend group already. You're all starting from square one. So everyone wants to make friends with each other. You know, everyone uh, would be nice to each other, you know. Um, so it really isn't that hard. What, what might be a bit difficult is finding your own like friend group, people that you'll stick to throughout the entire college. And it can take time. Uh, I wouldn't say that I found my, my own group already, even after finishing my first year. But, you know, just my biggest tip is just be open-minded and really like take in new experiences. Um, go out there, put yourself out there, meet new people. And yeah, just be generally a nice and friendly person overall. Um, I, some people are more reserved. That's okay. Um, but I think everything will fall in place eventually, right? Because when you study abroad, usually colleges um, are larger than high schools. So th there's just a variety of different people you can end up meeting and you know, becoming friends with. Number nine, it's um, something that people bring up to me because I study in Philadelphia, which is, you know, um, that studying abroad is dangerous because Philadelphia, um, you know, uh, has like kind of a record, um, a criminal, like, you know, um, a reputation rather, not a record of having a lot of, you know, crime and, you know, um, 
like peace and order is not so great there, which is kind of true. But at the same time, um, you just need to be very like self-aware and aware of your surroundings also. Like you need to know, don't go out, don't go to certain places alone late at night, right? You just have to be very careful. And um, personally, I've heard of some like scary stories, but I haven't encountered anything too scary or life-threatening on myself. You just have to be, you know, always go out with friends and, you know, don't, especially at night. You can go out alone during the day. I, I don't think that should be a problem. But yeah, just always have people around you when you're outside late at night. And just always, you know, know where to go in terms of like, you know, which place is generally not so safe, you know, avoid those places. Um, and then another myth that I didn't write down, but, you know, it's kind of related is, um, Kind of hate crimes or at least anti-asian crime uh, hate crimes i know like recently there's news about this 18 year old filipino who was assaulted in new york um so that tends to happen a lot um i wouldn't say i got physically um assaulted <laughs> when i was studying abroad but then there, there were definitely a few times when you know some people on the streets would make like a sort of a racist or like uh, um you know it's like they would there would be some microaggressions um, targeted towards me because I'm Asian. Like I remember, uh, I got hurt once playing basketball, so I was limping a bit. And then someone walked by me in the street, and he was like, "Oh," and he he made like a sarcastic joke, like, "Oh," he said, "Was it because you played too much kung? Uh, you you did too much kung fu or something?" And I just like shook my head and then just just walked away. Uh, I think the best the best thing to do is just really walk away. Don't confront these people. Um, and yeah, just get away, get as far away from the situation as possible. You, you don't want to escalate um, anything when you're there. You have to remember that, you know, you're there to study. Um, you're there as a guest, quote unquote. Um, so yeah, just don't cause trouble and don't, don't look for it either. Um, the last thing is that you won't have a support mechanism when you study abroad. So I, I already talked about like making friends and getting support from teachers and guidance counselors. But um this is more tailored towards like having a Filipino community abroad. And in my experience, at least at, at Penn, um, there's a very strong Filipino community already that's ready to be your support mechanism. So it's like your first friend group when you go to college. Um, and they're always going to be there because, you know, it's just different knowing people who come from the same background because you, you just click right away, uh, especially when you're abroad and, you know, far away from your home country. And, you know, the culture is very different. Like these people just understand you much better and much more quickly. So that usually exists in a lot of the more, uh, like the larger, more popular colleges. But, you know, some colleges don't really have many Filipinos. And that's okay too, you know. There are always going to be international students that you can relate with. Um, and yeah, because you're in the same situation, right? You come into... America or the UK or whatever country you're going to and you know you're, you're a guest you're you're like you're new to the whole um, environment and situation and you're still trying to navigate your way through so you know everyone if you ever feel that you don't have anyone to turn to just you know just know that there are also a lot of people who are um, like kind of in the same position as you are and again just put yourself out there um, be open-minded and yeah, I think it should be fine. So that's it for my talk about the, um, that. Those are my 10 myths. If you have any questions, yeah, uh, just drop them in the q and I'll be happy to answer. I think Q is also here and she's happy to answer a few questions too. Yeah. So you, someone asked, do graduate from schools abroad, get more opportunities in the future? So I would say definitely yes, because you know if you're a graduate from an American university, then you'll have more opportunities in America in terms of finding work or in terms of applying to graduate school um, compared to someone who graduates from the Philippines because obviously like American firms would recognize American colleges more. So yeah, that's definitely, yes, okay. What's your biggest reason not to study? Oh, it's, it's always financial aid, um, which is like, it's a sad reality, but studying abroad really is um, a heavy load on your wallet, on your parents' wallets. And that's what kind of makes most people turn away from it. 
But then again, um, as I brought up earlier, it's really about like you have to put your mind to it, right? If you really want to study abroad, um, and you know the camp conference is really to give you more information about the experience studying abroad and low key trying to convince you to consider it also. But yeah, it's about that. It's about being able to prepare early, early on, and you know find the necessary sources of um, financial uh, finances rather. Um, yeah. I can add to that actually. Um, if, for example, you want to do med or uh, law, for example, in the Philippines, there are uh, accelerated programs in med, such as like Leap Med or IMEDs from U USD and UP. Um, um, so if you want to do that and you want to work in the Philippines in the future, that's also a reason not to study abroad because it will make your... Um, your road to becoming a doctor like a lot longer and if you are like doing intending to do law or yeah abroad as well uh, the thing with law is where you study it that's where you're most likely to um, practice it so I mean if you're going to study law in the U.S. it might be a bit more difficult if you uh, go back to the Philippines and work as a lawyer here because you need to retake the bars and stuff like that. So uh, those are some additional reasons to not study abroad. Yeah. You're muted. <laughs> My bad. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> the next question is kind of related to the first. Uh, what additional benefits do you get? Um, do those who finish their undergraduate degree abroad get compared to those who study there for master's only? Um, I think it's like in terms of, um, like employability or like recruiting to get a job. Um, if you finish your undergraduate degree there, right away you can already look for a job there. Versus if you finish it here in the Philippines and you try to apply to a job abroad, I mean it's it's quite difficult actually. Um, and much less likely that you'll get it. But, and obviously you have to wait a longer time because I'm here if you study, finish your undergraduate degree, um, you probably still would want to work a bit before doing a master's or even if you jump straight to master's, that's an extra two years you need to take. So that kind of pushes you back two years versus when you get an undergraduate degree abroad there, you can just go to work right away. And, you know, those two years can be spent getting experience and then you can apply for a master's abroad you know, you know, follow the same path. So it's about timing and also less employability, I'd say. Okay, and then the next question is, what is your take on school ranking? How should these stats be taken into account in choosing schools? Oh, uh, I, I, I'm not a big fan, to be honest, of school, school rankings, because like, I don't, you know, there's so many things to consider about a school and, you know, to give the school a grade and a number from all those factors, it's just very hard. And we don't really know what goes into it either. I think my biggest tip with school rankings is you have to look at the particular program or particular major that you're interested in and then look at the rankings. I think that would be the most accurate because you're only looking at one criteria and, you know, but then again, you shouldn't be considering going to a school just because of the major. You have to consider like location. Yeah, location is very important. When I applied to um, UPenn, uh, I didn't consider the location. I didn't realize that Philadelphia could get really cold. So that's something that I should have considered. But then even the small things like that actually really matter. Um, location, climate, just like urban or rural, um, size in terms of like, faculty to student ratio so like how many teachers there are compared to students and all that so you should look at the rankings for those individually and just not the overall ranking of the school because it's like yeah then again like we don't know what goes into it and they're usually kind of biased so yeah um yeah wait I want to add to that actually so before I was just looking at like world rankings and um, between my choices of schools, um, there was one that was significantly higher in the world rankings than the school I currently go to. Um, so at first that we were like, uh, what, why will we choose the school I currently go to when um, 
that other one was higher. Um, but then like when you go here in the UK and you actually check like the rankings, the reputation, the opportunities um, for jobs after um, how well your school is perceived, um, it's so different um, bit, like from the world rankings. So it's also like a consideration is it sometimes it's better to check like the um, the country's rankings instead of your like the world rankings because it's like what Conrad said it might be biased and again it's more of your fit to the school rather than like the rankings so yeah yeah um do you find a say abroad and work there yeah I find a say abroad and work there a few years and then come back to the Philippines and in terms of why I think that getting work experience abroad is like something you know you only live once right and it's something that you won't be able to experience later on in life because like you know if you're 40 years old you wouldn't want to go to the U.S. to work and then come back again right so it's, it's just timing and yeah just experiencing new things what states are safer and more common for international students to go in um I don't want to like make you like plant like a biased like view uh, in, in your head but typically I'll just I'll just tell you um it's like the northeastern states or like California those are the popular states for a lot of um, students to go to uh, northeastern states are like New York Boston Pennsylvania yeah and like other schools like Yale is in Connecticut um you know <laughs> Yeah. Does the EDEAs are the um oh, okay are EDs and EA applicants oh wait ED and EA much more selective with admissions. Uh, so there was this is sort of a myth actually there was a big myth before that if you apply ED or EA, you have a better chance of getting in. But then again, um, you have to consider that people who apply ED or EA are also they're confident that they can get in. That's why they want to get in right away. And they're also very like dead set. They're very, um, they're dead set on the particular college that you're applying to because ED is binding, right? So if you get in, you can't choose another school. You're forced to go to that particular school. So um, it's a bit of both. I There are pros and cons. And it, it, that's what I'm trying to say. Um, it is more selective, but at the same time, you're also showing more initiative and you're showing your commitment to the school, which is a plus. So um if it's honestly if it's ea uh, i'd say go for it but if it's ed you really have to give it some thought right because uh, if you get in then you really have to go so you have to be 100 that it's your dream school and everything uh, yeah and the next question is are you on some type of financial aid or scholarship no unfortunately not but i know a lot of people who are so you know if you have any questions about it you can Hit me up. I'll actually drop my email here in the chat uh, for everyone. And then I can try to answer it myself or I can just refer you to someone for sure. What do you think is the best thing studying abroad? I think it's just the experience of just meeting new people. Um, like That's really what I um, kind of savored the most in my first year. It's not actually the subject I'm taking or, you know, um, like the prestige or anything. It's just meeting people that you would not be able to meet or you wouldn't have the opportunity to meet if you studied here locally. Um, and it's just because it really, like, this is a really cliche, but it really broadens your horizons, right? You really um, get to know people from around the world and, you know, be exposed to their culture, their views. And I think it really, it makes you a smarter person. <laughs> it, it makes you more uh, aware and more appreciative of what you have and you know what goes on around the world which is something that I think is invaluable and you can't really put a price tag on it which is why I think studying abroad even if it's expensive it's worth it is worth it yeah. if you want to study med and practice in the Philippines would you guys still recommend studying abroad actually a lot of people do that um they do pre-med abroad and then they come back from med school because I think I'm not sure but 
that's what pe- people tell me basically that it's easier um i mean because if you study you get if you do a pre-med program abroad it's like supposedly more recognizable i guess so i i do know a lot of people who do that um or who do pre-med here and then go to medical school there and then come back to practice that's also pretty common um yeah a lot of doctors do that actually um yeah based on my observation like i, I would look at the wall and like oh this doctor went to georgetown from um, like med school um you know but he also went to the ateneo for pre-med um but i think this this one is more common people doing pre-med here and then going abroad to like do med school or, or do the residency before coming back to practice uh yeah what's your advice for building in college this um start big so i'd say because I, I used the long list, short list tactic. So a long list would be like a list of 25, 30 schools that you're considering. And then, and usually these schools are like schools you know by name or things you've heard. I, oh, I've heard about like um, New York, NYU, right? Um, that's a very popular choice for Filipinos. Like you just put that in. And then um, you look at the rankings too and all of that, and then you add those into all this. And then based on that, that's when you go shopping. Yeah, like you look at each school, look at the programs they offer, um, look at the, the size of the school, the location, all, all your factors. So come up with some criteria that you look at. What do you value the most, right? Because for me, it was like, I value the program the most. Like what major does the school offer? And what about the major is like unique to other schools? And then like make a ranking. So it was like, you can rank program, um, location of school, like urban versus rural, right? Um, and then location generally in america so like oh northeast or do you want like you know a, a warmer state like california or do you want an even warmer state like florida um <laughs> right and then yeah just make the rankings from then and then yeah so start with a long list and then kind of assess each school using your criteria and then shorten that list to around like 15 i think 15 is pretty good enough number yeah 10 to 15 what are you studying right now? So I'm studying this thing called cognitive science, which is um, basically it's a mix of computer science and psychology and a bit of economics. So it's like things I, I'm most interested in economics and psychology, but actually my parents want me to do this, like something techie, techie and computer science related. That's why I'm doing it. So it's like, you know, seeking that balance, I'm finding common ground with my parents who are funding me. Um, but it is it is interesting. I think uh, because it's so multidisciplinary, like it allows me to do a lot of things when I graduate or like when I look for internships or jobs, right? Like I can go into more business businessy stuff, or I can also do a bit of tech stuff, like what I'm doing right now, um, or I can go into data also, you know. So I I do really enjoy my program. I I think it's quite unique actually. I know um some other schools offer it too, but yeah, um, it's not as common. It's kind of like an emerging field. Do I have some regrets about Penn? I, I wouldn't say I do. Um, yeah, I think I really enjoy the community there also. Um, like the Filipinos, we call ourselves Pennois. Um, we aren't a lot, actually. There are only like around five every year. Um, like much, they get around 10 people every year, but you know, most people, they either go to another school or they have other reasons why they don't event actually go to Penn. But you know, so we're a tight group of like five people, and like, I yeah, I really um, have no regrets. Like, I like them a lot, and I feel at home when I'm there. Um, should we submit SAT scores if they fall in the lower end of the average grade of students admitted to the school? Yeah, here's the thing. This is very important. So. The advice that my counselor gave was to not do that. So if your grade falls on the lower, um, like they give you the median, right? I think. And if your grade falls on the lower end, then it might be best not to submit it. But I don't know. What do you think? You? <laughs> That's what I was told. Um, I submitted my, I, uh, my SAT score right away to all, um, all the schools I applied to. But yeah, I think because you don't want something in your application to look bad quote unquote look bad right so if it falls on the lower end don't submit it and 
schools always guarantee that they won't take it against you. They won't even know that you actually took the test. That's the thing, right? So they'll just assume, oh, okay, this guy didn't take the test for whatever reason. And yeah, they'll get on with your application. So don't worry about it. Um, how's the party life in UPenn? So Penn has like a reputation for being a, the social um, uh, Ivy League school. So there is definitely a party life. And it's very, you know, every night there would be a party going on somewhere, someplace. Uh, I'm not the type to party a lot. Like, I don't know, it gets too hot and smelly for me. I, I'm the type of guy who likes getting like dinner with people outside and hanging out in people's apartments more. But you know, it's really up to you, right? Some people like they would go to a party Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, like you know, uh, like basically every night. But it's really up to you. Like you have so much freedom there. Um, yeah, you, you get to choose how you spend your time. So yeah, but party life is great. <laughs> Yeah. What is your advice for students that don't know what to take for college? So, okay. I didn't know what to take for college. Um, I just knew generally, oh, I like econ a bit. Oh, I like psychology a bit. Oh, my parents want me to do computer science. So like, um, and there I found my, um, I found something that like blends all of the three together. So it's not about, oh, I really want to be an economist when I grow up or like, oh, I want to become a software engineer for whatever a company like you don't need to know that right away but generally you need to you should know at this point like in your um, high school career like what subjects you like and what subjects you really dislike right so subjects I really dislike or like have no interest in are like chemistry <laughs> or like biology uh, unfortunately so like I really didn't um, shy away from like a pre-med program or anything related to like life sciences. So yeah, it's just, yeah, it's just based on your interests really. Yeah, um, did your school provide SAT waivers? Yeah, actually you, they, you basically just have to, there's like an extra step you have to take um, and to explain why you need an SAT waiver, but it, it actually isn't that hard to get. Um, it's all in the common app also. You don't have to look elsewhere to do it, yeah. What's your SAT score? So I got a 1510 um, when I took the SAT, like, wow, that was like three years ago, in December 2019. Yeah, I wanted to retake it, but then, you know, COVID happened. Yeah, that was actually really annoying because uh, I was preparing for three months, four months, and then I couldn't do it again. But, you know, it's not actually the highest score out there. Um, and you don't definitely do not need a 1500 or above to get in a good college. I know a lot of people who didn't even submit a score and they got it. So yeah, don't, don't be too pressed. I mean, it's good to take the SAT and you know, it's a good experience, I guess. Um, you can talk about it with your friends in like 20 years, but it's not the, you know, the, the be all and all of applying to college. How many schools did you apply to? So I ED Penn. So technically I only applied to one, but I was planning to apply to 11. Uh, 11 colleges yeah if I didn't get it so what is your advice for building a stronger application oh. um well <laughs> I mean that that's like okay I'll give you my biggest advice um so you know grades are grades whatever um but like I'll talk about extracurriculars more um do something that you really enjoy doing don't do something just for college applications or for the sake of doing it, right? Um, so like if you do debate, like I did, or model UN, um, make sure you actually enjoy it, right? Um, or you're having fun at least. Uh, because the last thing you want to do is spend a lot of time doing something, write about it, but then you write about it in a half-hearted way. And, you know, admissions offices, they read like thousands and thousands of applications every year. So they can sniff it out right away. Oh, this guy is just like, he's not too serious about this. Um, and it, it's a bad note, right? So as I said earlier, don't, it's really quality over quantity. Um, you don't need to be really, really good at a particular thing, but you just need to show that you're passionate, you want to learn more and yeah. That's my biggest tip about stronger, like writing stronger essays and building a stronger application. Is the SAT score around the 1300s decent to get into good colleges? So I don't know, like there's like good colleges is really vague. My biggest tip is again, to look at 
they, most schools publish or like most websites that do college applications, they publish like a range of essay, like the median SAT score of that particular school. So if you fall on the middle slash upper end, then it's a good enough score. If you don't, then I'd suggest not submitting it. That's just me though. You, you might want to ask around a bit more. <laughs> yeah. Do you feel somewhat superior being in an Ivy League school? I don't. I know a lot of people do. A lot of people get carried away. But then again, Ivy, the, being in an Ivy League school is just a title. I think it's a lot, it's a lot more like, um, how do you say this? It's a lot more like, people give it a lot more value here in the Philippines. But actually, when you're abroad, um, yeah, it's not really that big of a deal. And I feel like you shouldn't let it get in your head, you know? Like, okay, Ivy League schools are generally, like, you know, they, they sound nicer, right? Uh, I go to Harvard. Oh, yeah, well, good for you. But just because you don't go to Harvard doesn't mean that you can't get a good education and, you know, you can't meet great people and do great things. So, yeah, it's just a title at the end of the day, right? Um, so, yeah, don't worry about it. What do you think is a good GPA for top tier university? So usually you want to be in like the top, um, top 10, top 20 of your, because uh, GPA works differently in my high school than in other high schools. So um, yeah, top 10 and top 20 of your batch would be like, that's where you want to be. But then that's not a guarantee, right? If just because you're like the valedictorian doesn't mean you're going to get in either, or just because you're in the top 30, doesn't mean you're gonna not gonna get in. So I again, it's like a holistic process, right? They look at so many different things um, when judging your application. How can one maximize a well-rounded application? There's a fine line. Yeah, exactly, right. There's a fine line between being all over the place and well-rounded. So what my counselor told me, my my guidance counselor told me, um, is to look at three to five things that you really enjoy doing. And like I, I sound like a broken record here but that's really how you draw the line right um between oh okay oh someone joined the panel it's okay uh yeah that's how you draw the fine line between being kalat or being all over the place and actually have being well-rounded um yeah three to five things i really enjoy doing because you won't be able to write about all of them anyway in your resume or in your college, in your essays, right? So yeah. most schools require English language admission standards. What tests do you take to complete it? So my high school, because they taught in English already, so I didn't have to take it. But usually most people take the TOEFL or the IELTS. So uh, yeah, those are the two biggest ones. Yeah. But I think that's about it. Um, it's, yeah. Um, you there, Q? Yeah. Yeah. So thank you so much, Conroy. Um, I know you put your email in the chat. So if you have any questions for him, feel free to email that. And again, thank you everyone for coming to this talk. Uh, we have another talk tomorrow about um, transfer students, if you're interested in that. And we would have uh, other, uh, we'll start actually start our college fair on July 18th. So uh, go there and check out the schedule if you want to go to uh, the specific units that you're looking at. So again, thank you, everyone. And thank you, Conroy. Thanks. See you guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.